KETV Newswatch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. This is not my seat. It belongs to the people of the 2nd Congressional District. They've spoken. I respect that. Um, but I think we really have to, to just charge ahead with, because if we don't, uh, with finding bipartisan solutions, if we don't, we're going to run into a great deal of, you know, we're, we're going to be very unhappy. I want to represent the entire district. We're going to work hard in every neighborhood. It doesn't matter whether you voted for me or not. My job is to represent everywhere in this district, and I take that seriously. I'm going to show the passion, and I, want to, I don't want it to be my words. It's going to be my deeds that you'll see this, but we're going to work very hard in every part of our, our district, and I look forward to it. Just one of the promises Congressman-elect Don Bacon made to his supporters Wednesday afternoon, hours after Congressman Brad Ashford conceded the race, and he was declared the winner. Well, good morning. I'm Rob McCartney. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Wow, what an election. As promised, it is over, but is the country ready to unite and move forward? It's one of the issues we'll explore this morning as we recap the week that was and look ahead to the future. Retired General and Congressman-elect Don Bacon is here at 7 Burlington Station to talk about what's next. First of all, let's take a closer look at the race. Both Ashford and Baker went to bed Tuesday night not knowing who'd won. Ashford conceded shortly before 9 Wednesday morning, losing by more than 5,000 votes in the unofficial results. Well, during our discussions here on Chronicle and even during our debate, you see here, it was clear both Bacon and Ashford respect each other. And while they differed on some key issues, after the election was over, both admitted the tone was unlike anything they've seen. If we don't change, if we don't stop putting toxic partisan politics above the future of our country, we are in deep, deep trouble. I mean, we just have come off one of the most toxic presidential campaigns. Well, it is the most toxic presidential campaign in our history. And um, if we let that be the, the, the uh, uh, course and speed of our country, I fear for it my children and my, my grandchildren. I, it's all right to disagree, and we have, we're going to have those disagreements. We should do so in a more respectful manner. We need to turn down the heat, the name-calling, and, and the tone that's out there. I, I think we got to do better. And joining us this morning is 2nd District Congressional District's newest Congressman, Don Bacon. Congressman-elect, congratulations on the, on the Thank victory. Thank you. Honored to be here, and I'm very grateful to the voters for their trust. Right. Has it sunk in yet? Not really. Not really? <laughs> I've been working on very little sleep and smiling and talking to a lot of people and excited, but it hasn't really sunk in. So what have you been doing since, the, since Wednesday afternoon when you finally officially got it? Well, I've had about 500 emails, okay. 200 text messages, and maybe 50 phone calls. So I've been working through that. I've been doing a lot of media right. engagements and gave a speech last night. So we've just been running full. I have not had a time to slow down and catch my breath right now, uh, yet. Who's calling you? Who's, who's emailing you? All over. All over? I mean, friends. Other elected officials, mm -hmm. A to Z. A to Z, okay. <laughs> right. Family, you, you, you name it, they, they've been calling. <laughs> gotcha. Well, Tuesday night, let's go back to that Tuesday night. The results were going back and forth, right. back and forth. It was a roller coaster. Yeah, both your team and Ashford's team had told us that, hey, we're right where we thought we'd be. This is exactly playing out exactly how we thought it would play out. Walk us through that. Is it, you, you had to have been nervous. I was nervous. My team felt mm -hmm. very confident. Uh, they, I had like, there was like two or three people with their computers and right. all the results. And I think when we were down about 4,000 votes around 8 or 9 o'clock, mm -hmm. their analysis was I had to be down 7 or 8 to be in trouble. As they said, Don, you're going you're gonna to be a couple thousand, two or 3,000 votes up and end up being 5. Right. I didn't feel that way. When you're down 4%, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> but, you know, in the end, we, we've done our best. Right. And I know my opponent did his best, and you can't do anything more. Right. So you just you look at the TV and... Be ready for either, either result. Either result, yeah. So, <laughs> so tell me, why do you think you won? Well, I think folks were looking for something different. Nothing against my opponent in this case, but I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of sense that there are career politicians in Washington. Let's put in other people that have done something outside of running for office all the time. So I think that I brought a unique background, I think a mm -hmm. military background of people value because we have too few of it right now in Washington. I think that the fact that the Obamacare 
premiums skyrocketed, and all those all that came out the two or three weeks before the election right. also had a had an impact. I mean, the Nebraskans are going to be paying a 51 percent higher insurance premiums on average. That's a huge huge amount. So I think that that. When I was going around, it was national security was the number one issue, stagnant economy. But then about three weeks before the election, everyone went, what are we going to do to fix this broken Affordable Care Act? Well, and that ask, became the top issue. Let me ask you that. I mean, you, you said you want to repeal and then replace. Yeah. What do you say to those people who, who actually rely on the health care? Even though their premiums may have gone up, that's still their health care. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are, have health care and they're not using it because of the high deductibles. Okay. So you have folks who are got coverage but are not really covered. Because I've talked to people with $12,000 deductibles. Yeah, they're not going in. The, right. the, the, uh, healthcare for them now is still unaffordable. So I think we have to do a, a myriad of things to bring down the costs. But one, we have to increase the competition, whether it's for prescription drugs, that's part of it, mm -hmm. but also healthcare providers and insurance. If we can get a little more competition, it helps drive down rates. And I'm, you may have heard me tell the story before, even our own governor, when he had to shop for uh, MRIs, he called three places, he found one half the price of the most expensive one. And if we had more of that, that would help pull it down. But we need it with our pharmaceuticals as well. I think we need to provide individuals around the market, not, not employer-based health care. Uh, we need to give them the same tax breaks that employer-provided health care get as well. You know, that's, that's tax-free. Right. So we, we, there's a lot of different things. That's just a couple of ideas. Right. Let me ask you this. Uh, Republicans now have the House of Representatives, you have the mm -hmm. Senate, or you will after everybody's sworn in, and you have the White House, clean sweep. It's what's called the one-party rule. It doesn't happen a lot. It happens mm -hmm. sometimes that we had it with the Obama administration right. uh, when Affordable Act came in and mm -hmm. the stimulus plan went in. Uh, George uh, Bush had it. Uh, in 05, uh, same kind of deal. Dennis Hastert mm -hmm. was the speaker. Uh, some people say, I mean, the voter, and voters usually change that. It usually mm -hmm. lasts about one term, one two year term, right. and then voters say, hey, we need to change the balance back. It lasted about six years under Bush. Bush, right, right, right. But eventually yeah. it changes back. So do right. you, when you go in, and when you're going in, are you going to go in thinking clock is ticking? I got to get something done? I would say yes, but not for that same reason. Yeah. I think voters put us in to get a job done. And I don't think they want us wasting time and kicking the can down the road. So I th this is an opportunity to deal with a bureaucracy that's out of control, hurting our small business community. I think our federal debt needs to be dealt with. And that's a very painful thing. People right. don't want to, when, anytime you talk about reducing spending, it gets, it's tough. But we need people of courage to do it. I think that's where we failed last time as Republicans. When we had both Senate, House, and the President, we actually raised spending and our debt got much higher. And I think it, we lost the confidence of the American people because of that. We can't do that again. So I think the fact that we have the President, the Senate, and the House, we better perform and deliver. Uh, otherwise, we will be held accountable. We Talk, should be. Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and talking about uh, performance, freshman congressmen usually don't have much clout. You're one of 435. Oh, don't tell me that. I'm no. just saying. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to um, do to break through? I mean, are you going to go in and be a bulldog? What are you going to do? Well, I first of all, I want to be a person of character and integrity mm -hmm. and stand for what's right. I don't want to be the guy that's got his finger in the air on the polling and, and mm -hmm. worrying about the next election. But I think I could take stands that I think are right and be a voice for it and be and hope to be different in that regard. But I think one thing that makes me a little different, the fact that I'm a retired general, there's only going to be two general officers in the Senate and the House. I'll be one of them. And I think that that will give me a little more horsepower, at least in the Armed Services Committee, National Security, Foreign Affairs, because I, that's what I've been doing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, I'll be a freshman, but some of these areas, I'll have a little better voice. Gotcha. Speaking of a uh, retired general, are you going to take your keep your pension and take the congressman's salary too, or are you, what are we going to do here? Well, I, yes, I'll, I'll be earning the, the congressman's pay. Right. Right. Okay, because Congressman Ashford had once said he would take it, he would actually give some of the money back. Well, yeah, he said he does the, did the 10%. And I, right. you know, my dad uh, taught me well. I don't know if you got a chance to meet my dad. He was out here this week. Now, he went, when I was earning $2.50 as a seven, eight year old kid, he gave me $2, he gave me two quarters. He said, put one quarter in the offering plate and one quarter in savings. I've been able to maintain that, and I, I still believe in that. So okay. I would say I would be with Congressman Astrid on that. I, I believe we have a, a role for charity. Okay. How's the reelection campaign coming? Oh, well, okay, we're, we're still trying to give our speeches. <laughs> I, I understand that, but the reason I say that is because every congressman mm -hmm. I've ever talked to, they said they're always running for re-election in mm -hmm. the House uh, because you have a two-year term, and right. they're always fundraising. Yeah. And in, in your race, I mean, you guys had outs, so you and uh, Congressman Ashford had 
millions spent on or against you mm -hmm. from outside parties. Let me ask you that then. Uh, if you run for re-election, would you be open to limiting that outside money? You know what, I guess I haven't really thought about it, but I think it does add a bad flavor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we both, we had, think there was $8 million spent right. on TV. Or, so it was good for the economy here, I guess. It was or, good, yeah, it was great for TV, I'll say <laughs> it's that. It was great for TV. Right. But I, it is troublesome in that a lot of the ads are based on just a kernel of truth mm -hmm. and stretched to, I think, untruthful proportions, frankly. And it is, and I think we're better than that. But it wasn't just this race, we see it all over the country. I, I've obviously not, I'm still trying to pinch myself the fact that, you know, I was elected here on Tuesday, so I'm not even thinking about two years yet. Okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Um, think back to, uh, you'd said that you would support your party's nominee, mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump. And then, of course, the infamous tape came out on the bus, mm -hmm. and you had said, hey, he should step down, let Mike Pence stand, uh, take the lead on this. Right. Um, do you expect any fallout, or has uh, President-elect Trump called your mm -hmm. people yet, and, or do you expect to fall out when you get to Washington? You know, if there is, so be it. My mm -hmm. job is to do the best I can. And in the end, I supported our nominee because it was between him and Hillary Clinton. And I thought he was going to be a better president than she would be, and I, that's, and I, I spoke at the rally. But I, my job is to do what's right in my mind. And people, good people could disagree what that is. Mm -hmm. But I, I tried to follow the principle and my conscience on that, and I, I, can, I can live with it if there is some anger. Gotcha. Think he'll build a wall? I think it'll be talked about. I don't. I think we ought to let the experts figure out where do you need that versus what could virtual security do. I think maybe a one-size-fits-all approach isn't the wisest way to go. Right. But I'm sure it'll be a discussion item. I, I think we should be practical and figure out what, what really works. And I think what really works is employer enforcement and e-verify and some other measures because that gets to the root cause of that. And I think that'll allow us to actually solve the problem better. Uh, he had said that he would instruct his attorney general to appoint a special prosecutor to, to look into Hillary Clinton and her activities. Um, the law basically says he can't do that. Uh, do you plan to fight him on that, or what do you think? What are your thoughts on well, that? Well, I'd have to have the hear the legal opinion on it. But if it's right. not legal, obviously, it probably won't get to first base. Right. So you're going to tell you're going to tell the president elect, don't do that. Well, I think we should move past the general election here and, and look forward. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Well, I think we have big. Issues we've got to solve: 19.7 trillion dollar debt, a business econ or business environment where the small businesses are stagnant, and that's what concerns me. We have a readiness problem in the military at record lows. We should look forward right. and tackle the problems. I, I would prefer it's not looking backwards. Exactly, and that's exactly where I wanted to go. I, what, <laughs> which committees do you want to be on? Well, I, you know, in the military they taught me bloom where you're planted, because okay. sometimes you don't get a big the full voice. But if I had my choice, mm -hmm. I also would like to be on the Armed Services Committee. I'll be one of the most senior. Right. Probably the second most senior military member in the entire Congress, and I think I can make my voice count there. Mm -hmm. And then I would like a committee that has a good impact for the Omaha area. That could be agriculture business or you know, financial services or the insurance or telecommunications. Mm -hmm. it, we have such a great diverse economy here. There's a lot of op options, but whatever the second committee is, I, I want to make sure I can use it to benefit the district. And how often will you be coming back to the district uh Every weekend. Every weekend. Oh, yeah. I mean, unless there's a weird anomaly. Oh, sure. But right. generally, my goal is to come back Thursday night. Uh, I am a Midwesterner. I really don't like walking around Washington a whole lot. Right. So you won't have to worry about me moving there. <laughs> I mean, I had 16 assignments in the, Air, in the Air Force, two of them at the Pentagon, and the Pentagon was my 15th and 16th favorite. <laughs> Understand. <laughs> message, message received. Uh, so you're going to keep your house here, obviously. Yeah, yes. And uh, the... We're never selling our home unless there's something very strange occurs. My wife and gotcha. I moved 16 times. We like, I think we don't, we don't even have the paintings nailed, I mean, hanging, <laughs> they're, they're like nailed. <laughs> right, it's permanent now, it's, permanent. it's for yes. real, okay. So what is job one for you then? To do a good job and be, my job is to have the right spirit and attitude. And I think it's about defending our country and providing results. It's not about, it's just 5% higher in this poll versus that poll. What's gonna give me the best lead in for two years from now? What does our country need? And, so, and one of the nice things you talked about me being a retired military, I, this, isn't, this is not something I need to do. It's something I want to do to defend our country. So financially, I, if, I, if I take some hard stands over the next two, four years, whatever it may be, and I, I end up not being reelected at some point, it's all right. My job is to do the best things I can to defend and move the ball down the field in some key areas. That's what, so I want to have that spirit. Not, right. I feel like too many of our folks in Washington are worrying about two years from now, like you're saying, or 
right. the next re-election. And I, I don't want to be that guy. So you said you haven't really, you need to pinch yourself. Yeah. When will it sink in? I don't know. I'll tell you. I'll give you a call. Hey, it hit me. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. I will appreciate the call. All right. Well, Congressman-elect Don you. Bacon, thanks very much okay. and congratulations Thank you. again. Appreciate it. You bet. Well, we'll be right back with a closer look at some of the other significant issues voters decided Tuesday. First, though, a look at who you chose to go to Lincoln and represent you in the Nebraska legislature. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. People say, you know, those that are for the uh, death penalty, you need to ask yourself, will you be the one to push the button? Yeah. Those people that feel that we should not have a death penalty, I would invite them to see the crime scene photos. Look at the autopsy photos that we all did. I, I feel that the, the uh, lethal injection is too good for them. That's Bradley Waite. His sister, Shirley Sherman, was murdered by convicted serial killer Anthony Garcia. And Garcia is now eligible for the death penalty. Welcome back to KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. It's possible the state could execute Garcia after the vote Tuesday. Here's a look at the final numbers. More than two-thirds of Nebraskans voted to repeal the repeal and reinstate capital punishment. But the fight is far from over. KETV News Watch 7's Andrew Ozaki talked with State Senator Ernie Chambers, who's vowing to change the law yet again. It's not unexpected. It's not a surprise. State Senator Ernie Chambers calls Tuesday's vote just a setback in his over four-decade quest to abolish the death penalty in Nebraska. When January comes, I will have a repeal bill drafted, and I will offer it and push for it during the remaining four years that I have here. Chambers says just because capital punishment is back on the books doesn't mean any of the 10 inmates on death row will be executed. There are federal challenges that could affect Nebraska's law, and the state has had trouble getting some of the drugs to carry out a death sentence. The latest attempt through a foreign broker ended up with no drugs in the state out $54,000. If somehow a new protocol for carrying out an execution will be put in place, that will create new avenues of appeal. Chambers is also in phase that there will be 17 new lawmakers this session. Seven received campaign contributions from Governor Pete Ricketts. I've always had opposition. It'll just be a different kind, but it'll remain to be seen whether they're going to be their own people or whether they'll be those who join the ranks of what I call Ricketts crickets. Chambers says he's used to standing alone on many issues, including this one. I don't want a barbaric provision like that on the law books of the state where I live, so I'm going to try to have it removed, even though with it there, I doubt that there will be another execution in Nebraska. In Lincoln, Andrew Ozaki, KETV, Newswatch 7. So right now, Nebraska's governor and attorney general are working on a plan to carry out executions. We talked with Doug Peterson about the next step in the process. I'm concerned about putting out any type of timeline because of any unforeseeable things that may occur. So I don't, I don't mean to be evasive by saying that, but it's simply, um, I don't think it's wise to suggest a timeline uh, because there may be different variables that might affect that timeline. Among them, the method of execution, including whether to use just one drug or a combination of drugs. Regardless of what happens, the issue remains an emotional one for Nebraskans for and against the death penalty. KATV News Watch Evans Chindone spoke with both sides of the day after the election. These are the faces of Nebraska's 10 death row inmates, all convicted of murder. Life is the most valuable thing that there is, and if you take a life, you need to pay for a life. And uh, if the consequences are less than that, it lessens the value of life. 
Katrina Pancake is one of the 482,000 people who voted to bring back the death penalty after lawmakers abolished it last year. I have to say this to Nebraskans, we do not use it often and that's a good thing. It's for the worst of the worst. We've executed a total of 23 people in the history of the state of Nebraska. The group Nebraskans for the death penalty and volunteers collected 166,000 signatures to get the issue on Tuesday's ballot. Rod Edwards tells us it cost $1.4 million dollars in petition drives, legal fees and campaigns, but was worth it. Meantime, opponents, such as Nebraskans for alternatives to the death penalty, say they feel for the victims, but taking another life is not the answer. Even though they are hoping for closure, the reality is that there aren't going to be any executions anytime soon, and the process will continue to drag out. Stephen Griffith says capital punishment does not prevent crime, but instead is expensive and risky. The problems remain, even though the voters have put it back on the books, the, the death penalty is still broken. That was Chin Doan reporting. Attorney General Peterson says his office and the Department of Corrections are working together to make sure you have a chance to offer your input in the future. All right, a couple more issues we have been following. Douglas County voters overwhelmingly approved a public safety bond. The $45 million measure gets 68% of the vote. The money will be used to improve the 911 system and the county jail, and you won't see a tax increase. Concern over property taxes prompts voters across southeast Nebraska to reject a $369 million bond issue. 67% voted no. Southeast Community College wanted the money to upgrade buildings in Lincoln, Milford, and Beatrice. And Gretna voters say no to a sales tax increase that would have paid for park improvements. 53% voted against it. In Iowa, a shift of power in the state legislature. Republicans now control both the House and the Senate. The GOP flipped several Senate seats, including District 8, which covers Council Bluffs, former Senate Majority Leader Mike Gronstall losing to Republican newcomer Dan Dawson. It's a seat Gronstall held since 1985. People just want to see something different, you know. Uh, I think they're scared which way the country's going, the direction. I think they're scared, you know, a lot of individual levels. And uh, I think that was part of my race was offering, uh, you know, a new perspective and try to take a fresh look at things as opposed to same old, you know, intrinsic uh, politics. Uh, we reached out to Senator Gronstall for comment, but he never responded to our calls or messages. And we will be right back with some final thoughts. First, a reminder, your comments are an important part of the show. In fact, after last week's Chronicle got a number of comments, Bill Hancher of Blair creatively wrote this. Elections are like a bad haircut. Complaining won't change the results. You just have to learn to live with it until the next time. If you want to be heard, email your comments to news at KETV.com. Remember, we love hearing from you, and we'll be right back. That's the way politics works sometimes. We, we try really hard to persuade people that we're right. And then people vote. And then if we lose, we learn from our mistakes, we do some reflection, we lick our wounds, we brush ourselves off, we get back in the arena, we go at it. We try even harder the next time. You're watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. So if your candidate didn't win, what are your options? You can certainly share your opinions on social media, but an even better choice, if you're celebrating or still licking your wounds, get involved. Find the cause you're passionate about, that your candidate backed, and work with that group. Make the community where you live a better place to call home. Well, remember, if you missed any part of this show or you want to watch it again, it's online at KETV.com. I'm Rob McCartney. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next Sunday morning for KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle.